All right, we have uh, we have Colonel Ryan Dillon joining us live today from Baghdad for our uh, weekly uh, Operation Inherent Resolve update. Thank you for uh, everybody for your flexibility and Ryan for you for your flexibility in doing this today. But we didn't want to go th with a week without missing you. So happy Friday to you. Right back at you, Jeff, and everybody. Ryan, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. There's a lot to cover this morning, and I know you all have many questions, so let's just jump right into it. We'll start in Syria and then move to Iraq. Our partner force in Raqqa, the Syrian Democratic Forces, are in their third week of offensive operations to unseat terrorist fighters from ISIS de facto capital. The SDF have taken 45 square kilometers of ground from ISIS in and around Raqqa this past week. The SDF continue to fight along three axes towards the center of Raqqa against substantial ISIS resistance. Moving from the east, the SDF have reached the ancient Al Rifa wall. From the northwest, they continue to push past the sugar factory amidst well emplaced IED laden defenses. And from the west, they continue steady progress, one neighborhood at a time, into the city. South of the Euphrates River, the SDF continue to push eastward to retake ISIS-held territory. On 18 June, last Sunday, a US F-18 Super Hornet shot down a regime SU-22 jet in defense of coalition partner forces that were operating within an agreed-upon regime SDF deconfliction area. And in southern Syria, a U.S. F-15 shot down an Iranian-made Shahid-129 armed drone as it approached our forces near Atanif. The regime drone, advancing in a similar manner to their attack on 8 June, was shot down as it approached its weapons employment zone. The coalition has made it clear to all parties, publicly and through deconfliction line with Russian forces, that the demonstrated hostile intent and actions of pro-regime forces toward coalition and partner forces will not be tolerated. The coalition re-emphasizes that we do not seek to fight Syrian regime or pro-regime forces. Partnered with them, our mission is to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Moving to Mosul, in the last two days, Iraqi security forces made significant progress pushing into the old city and also isolating the al Jamuri hospital severing the two remaining areas held by ISIS. Emblematic of their own impending destruction, on 21 June, ISIS destroyed the historic Grand al-Nuri Mosque from which al-Baghdadi proclaimed the caliphate in July 2014. The nearly 800-year-old mosque and the famous leaning al-Hadba Minaret stood as a symbol of faith and unity for the people of Mosul. ISIS used this mosque to publicly justify its criminal campaign of genocide, mass rape, slavery, and murder. On Wednesday night, as Iraqi counterterrorism service members moved within 50 meters of the mosque, ISIS detonated it with explosives. Their destruction of the mosque and its, uh, is another despicable act, another crime that is consistent with the hundreds of other ancient and historic artifacts ISIS has destroyed in their wake. The time is near when Iraq will celebrate their long-fought victory over ISIS and Mosul. There's no question about that. And there's no question to the significant effort that will be required to stabilize West Mosul. However, if there was any doubt in Iraqi resolve in their ability to quickly rebound from adversity, all you need is to go to East Mosul. Wednesday this week, I accompanied our deputy commander British Army Major General Rupert Jones to East Mosul. While there, we met with the Chief of Police for the Nineveh Province, Brigadier General Watik. He is responsible for security throughout Mosul and its surrounding areas. General Watik briefed us from his headquarters, highlighting the fusion of Iraqi police, army, and popular and tribal mobilization forces, 
how they have collectively captured almost 400 ISIS fighters in the last three months in both East and West Mosul and in IDP camps. He also emphasized that civilians have been an increased source of information leading to arrests and stopping attacks before they happen. My father used to say, don't tell me, show me. Well, after General Watik's briefing, we went to the Prophet Yunus Market, not far from Mosul University, and got to see firsthand what life is like in East Mosul now. Driving to the market, multiple crews of 20 to 30 workers were shoveling rubble into wheelbarrows, sweeping the streets, and fixing signs and sidewalks. Once we arrived to the market, it was teeming with activity, busy with hundreds of people selling and buying everything you could think of. Nuts, fruits, clothes, candy, fish, and gold. And it was brought to my attention that because of Ramadan, most people were in their homes at the time that we were there. And a shop owner told me, uh, this is nothing. Uh, there are at least double this amount, amount of people after breaking fast at sundown. And while I saw this with my own eyes, there are some significant figures that further illustrate the progress. 191,000 Moslawis are back in their homes. 350,000 children are back in school. 320 out of 400 schools have reopened. And four of nine water treatment plants are providing water to nearly a million people, with more than three and a half million liters trucked in daily. The Greater Coalition will do all we can in working with Iraqi authorities to make sure that these trends continue, while mindful of the extraordinary difficult nature of this battle and what lies ahead. West Mosul stabilization efforts unquestionably will be more difficult. The level of destruction has proved to be more extreme, but the Iraqi resolve, determination, and support from the global coalition and international community will all help to bring West Mosul back. In closing out, before I take questions, I would like to recognize that this afternoon at Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado, my predecessor, someone you all know very well, Colonel John Dorian, is set to retire after 25 years of service to our country. He's a professional, a leader, and a mentor, but most importantly, he's just a good dude. So in appropriate JD fashion, I will now be delighted to take your questions. Start with Bob Burns from the Associated Press. Uh, thanks, Colonel. Uh, a couple questions related to Russia. Uh, do you have any uh, reason to believe the Russians are incorrect in asserting that they have killed Baghdadi, al Baghdadi? Uh, do you have any comment on their cruise missile strike uh, today in Syria? And also, can you give us any update on the activity on the deconfliction line today? All right, uh, sir, thanks for that. First off, uh, with the Russian claims of uh, killing al-Baghdadi, uh, we will hold fast with the, our uh, previous statements in that uh, we do not have any definitive proof to, uh, to uh, corroborate uh, their claims to that. Uh, we certainly would welcome the death of al-Baghdadi, um, but we do not have any definitive proof uh, to lead us to believe that that is accurate. Uh, secondly, on the cruise missile strikes uh, that you'd mentioned from Russia, um, we uh, are still using, and the deconfliction line is open, and it is open for a reason, to make sure that our collective uh, air crews and, and forces on the ground are operating in a safe uh, manner, and that uh, there are no strategic mishaps that happen as a result of un, uh, deconflicted actions. Um, I think that answers all your questions. Uh, please follow up if you need to. I do have one follow-up there. Um, um, you brought those two points together about deconfliction and the cruise missile strike. Are you saying that they, did they use it to alert you that they were about to do the cruise missile strikes to deconflict the airspace? We won't discuss every single uh, detail that uh, is talked about on the deconfliction line. I will say that the deconfliction line is in use, and it is in use uh, to make sure that uh, we, 
uh, deconflict our, our actions and make sure that uh, our crews, air crews, and uh, uh, ground forces are uh, safe. Uh, next to Lori Milroy from Kurdistan 24. Thank you, Colonel. There have been reports that Turkey is reinforcing its military presence in northern Syria in preparation for a, an attack on the Kurdish canton of Afrin. Do you have any further information on that, and do you have any comment? Uh, we have seen the, these reports as well, uh, but I don't have any further comment uh, to, to talk about that. Our focus right now is uh, in northern Syria, is on Raqqa, and uh, as I mentioned in our opening, uh, the status and the update of uh, our uh, partnering with the SDF and, and what, how, what they're doing there in Raqqa. So you don't have any information to judge whether those reports are accurate or not so accurate? Um, we'll just say that uh, we have seen uh, some movement, but uh, you know, I don't have any further comment uh, on that right now. Thank you. Okay, uh, next to Barbara Starr. I'm sorry, Nancy Youssef, you were next in line. Nancy Youssef from uh, BuzzFeed. Um, I had a question about um, the operations in Raqqa. There have been allegations on the ground from local groups that the SDF has harmed or killed civilians in and around Raqqa. I'm curious if you've had uh, seen similar reports and had a ways um, to look at them, and is there a means to investigate allegations of civilian casualties by the U.S.-backed SDF? Well, as you know, we will we'll look into civi uh, civilian casualty allegations. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we will also, if we see any kind of uh, violation of law of armed conflict, uh, we have a duty to uh, report that. Uh, we have not seen that. I, I'm not aware of any uh, particular instances or events uh, that have been uh, reported or seen. Uh, but as far as the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, I do not know if uh, they are uh, investigating or looking into allegations. I certainly know that, that we are, and we have our process, and we uh, present our uh, civilian uh, casualty report on a monthly basis. Sorry, to clarify, you, you look into civilian casualties by U.S. strikes. Is You don't look into them for SDF? That is correct. Uh, we do not. And, there's, and, and it falls then on the SDF to look into allegations of civilian casualties. Uh, I missed uh, that, a little bit of that question there, Nancy. Uh, what was that again, please? It falls on the SCF to then look into allegations of civilian casualties by their forces. Is that right? Uh, well, I, I do not know if they are you know, looking into those uh, or not. I know that uh, we uh, definitely look into ours, any allegations that we take very seriously. I can't speak for the SDF. Uh, next, Barbara Starr, CNN. Hi, Colonel Dillon. Thank you for doing this. A couple of questions. Um, the Mayadeen area, can you bring us up to date on what you see there in terms of an ISIS leadership presence, especially because the last several HVTs that have been killed have been in that area? So, so what do you think the ISIS presence is in Mayadeen? How are you going to get after it? And related, what's your assessment now of Russia's ability to actually influence Iranian-backed forces, as well as the regime, but in particular Iranian-backed forces, to steer clear of your forces? Okay, so the, uh, to the first question about Mayadeen, um, I mean, we are, are very much uh, looking at uh, ISIS uh, resources, fighters, leaders, not just in Raqqa, that is clearly where our focus is, 
But if you look into our daily strike releases, you'll see that uh, we continue to strike ISIS targets uh, wherever we find them. And in the specific to what you were asking, um, I don't have the details right here in front of me, but I know that uh, we have struck several HVIs, uh, high value targets, uh, in and around the Abu Kamal, Deir Azor, and Mayadeen area um, since I've uh, been in this position. Uh, at the end of May, when I was in London, uh, two out of the three uh, HVTs that I uh, had announced uh, were in Mayadeen. Uh, you had Turkey Al Bin Ali uh, that was announced last week. He was also in, in Mayadeen. And then you have uh, some others in Abu Kamal and uh, Deir Azar. Uh, this is still ISIS held territory. And we know that they have resources, uh, particularly uh, financial resources in the, in the way of oil uh, revenue uh, producing uh, things that they have in and around Deir Azor. So we will continue to strike uh, in these areas uh, when we have uh, the targets and they do not have any sanctuary. ISIS has no sanctuary uh, wherever they hold uh, ground. Now to your second question about Russian um, influence over Iran, I, I can't speak for that. I know that we will continue to use a deconfliction line uh, for you know, the reasons as I've mentioned before, to make sure that our crews and our forces on the ground uh, can stay focused on what it is that they are here to do, which is to defeat ISIS. But if I could just follow up, at this point now, you've had several incidents. More directly, what th potential threat do you believe these Iranian-backed militias and regime forces continue to pose to your forces and your partner forces in the Atomf Abu Kamal area? Well, if the, the Syrian regime, and it looks like they are making a concerted effort uh, to move into ISIS-held areas, and if uh, they show that they can do that, that is not a bad sign. Uh, we are here to fight ISIS as a coalition, uh, but if others want to fight ISIS and defeat them, then you know, we absolutely have no problem with that. And uh, as they move eastward towards Abu Kamal and uh, to Deir Azor, uh, the, if we, as long as we can deconflict and make sure that we can focus on what it is we're there to do without having any kind of strategic mishaps with the regime or with uh, pro-regime forces or with Russians, then uh, that is, we're perfectly happy with that. Okay, uh, next to Jack Detch, Christian Science Monitor. Thanks for doing this, Colonel. Um, I'm curious sort of with the shoot down of the SU-22 and sort of all the activity we've had in and around the deconfliction zone, does that call for a need for an expanded AUMF given that General Dunford said the 2001 AUMF covered that activity? Um, I'm not familiar with the AUMF, uh, but what I can say is that uh, as you know, at least in the course of the, the last uh, few days, you know, things have uh, gotten back to the way we want them, you know, de-escalated, and we have also uh, been able to focus on what it is that we're doing. Um, so I don't know if you want to ask uh, further about the AUMF. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, but right now, we will continue to work deconfliction lines and deconfliction channels to make sure that we can focus on what we're doing. Okay, at least do you plan on sort of releasing any, any numbers or, um, I mean, it seems like there's kind of been an uptick in activity of pro-regime forces in and around that area. I mean, do you plan on releasing any numbers that, that indicate that activity at all? Um, I, I think uh, what we have, as far as the uh, the strikes that have happened uh, on you know, regime forces and pro-regime forces, uh, we have uh, come forth on that. As far as numbers of the, the Syrian units and the regime units that are continuing to move east, um, that is not something that, that we will provide and give detailed information on if you're talking about number of T-72 tanks or technical vehicles or number of uh, soldiers. Uh, that is not something I expect that we are going to provide to the public. Uh, Joe Tabbitt, Alvaro. 
Thank you, Colonel Dillon. Uh, if I could go back to, to Baghdadi, if you don't have any information that he was killed, could you confirm that he's still alive? Uh, uh, I don't have any you know, particular uh, concrete uh, evidence to say that he is uh, still alive. Um, uh, we certainly know that if he is still alive, uh, we expect that he is not being able to influence uh, what is currently happening in Raqqa or Mosul or overall in the ISIS as they continue to lose uh, their physical caliphate. Uh, that said, we don't have any concrete evidence on whether or not he's dead either. So uh, our statement uh, stands, and uh, we still cannot confirm with 100 percent assurity uh, that al-Baghdadi has been killed. Uh, a quick, quick, excuse me, quick follow-up uh, on Mosul. Why do you think ISIS blew up the Anuri Mosque? What's the reason that led ISIS to blow up the mosque? I can't tell you why they would have uh, blown up the mosque, uh, but I will say that it is consistent with uh, the things that they've done in the past. Uh, they have absolutely no concern at all for you know, people's uh, you know, ancient artifacts or history or, or anything like that. I can't even fathom you know, how ISIS thinks. Um, it is deranged, and, and the, their actions are theirs alone, so this doesn't surprise me that they would do something like this, especially during Ramadan, uh, which goes completely even further against uh, uh, Islam. So I, I can't tell you what they are thinking. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anybody can. Okay, uh, next to Nafisa Saeed from Bloomberg. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to get an idea of when we talk about co continued coalition airstrikes, uh, who's actually carrying out the mis missions? Is it still mostly the U.S., or what other countries that are part of the coalition are still actually actively carrying out those uh, strikes as well? Oh. We don't typically get into you know the the um, by aircraft or by country, uh, but we we do have uh, multiple uh, countries that are supporting the coalition, uh, not just in the air but on the ground, and we will continue to conduct strikes to make sure that our partner forces in both uh, Iraq and in Syria can continue their advance uh, on ISIS in both of those countries. Uh, next to Tara Kopp, Stars and Stripes. Hey, Colonel Dillon. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the cruise missile strike? Confirm that it was six missiles that were launched and where they hit, and at what point uh, was the coalition aware that they were in the air? Uh, was it before launch, or were you tracking them from the ship? Um, were there any forces ever, uh, coalition forces ever in danger, either on the ground or aircraft? Uh, Tara, I'm not going to, you know, talk on behalf of uh, the Russians. I think that's something that is a question for them about their strikes. I just can tell you that the deconfliction line remains open, and it is open for the reason to make sure that uh, our forces are out of the way of, you know, potential strikes or potential actions uh, from uh, Russia and any other actors that are working with them. Did you find out about the launch through the deconfliction line, or did you find out through other methods? Again, I'm just going to say that the deconfliction line is open, and it is working, and uh, we can make sure that our forces are, uh, can continue to focus on their missions on the ground and in the air. Once the coalition was aware that there were six missiles headed into Syria, what, uh, I guess, efforts were made to ensure that forces on the ground or aircraft were out of harm's way? If we know through the deconfliction line that there are going to be uh, particular strikes uh, and our forces are not in the area, 
uh, then uh, that is how we want things to be. So the deconfliction line remains open. We're not going to discuss uh, every detail uh, about what is discussed on that deconfliction line. But I can tell you in the last 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, we have been able to make sure that we can stay focused on what we're doing without any kind of incursion or strikes or harm to our soldiers and our partner forces. Uh, Zachary Biggs from Jane's. Thanks. Uh, Colonel, so uh, after the F-18 shut down the Syrian regime aircraft, the Russians made the threat about uh, coalition aircraft west of the Euphrates. Um, obviously, coalition aircraft have continued to operate in that area, but have any anti-aircraft systems illuminated any of those aircraft during their operations after that incident? And then a, a separate uh, follow-up there, uh, just um, with claimed territory in Syria, what's the organization to make sure that the SDF is able to hold that territory? Obviously, in Iraq, you've got the Iraqi military to manage that, but since it's more of a coalition of disparate forces, how is Syrian territory being secured after it's reclaimed? Okay, so to your first question in reference to uh, whether or not uh, our aircraft, after the uh, statements made, uh, were painted or illuminated, I think is what you, the way you brought that up. Um, we were able to continue to operate uh, throughout the rest of Syria, and as uh, I think uh, you may have read from Lieutenant General Harry Harigian's uh, statement and comments to um, New York Times, uh, we will continue to operate in areas, but we're going to make sure that our air crews uh, are, you know, can manage that safely. And, and if it takes uh, specific aircraft with specific capabilities uh, to fly in, in particular areas, then that is what um, he will do as a commander. That is what our, uh, our air crews uh, will continue to do. Uh, we're not going to get into uh, the details on whether or not you know, certain aircraft were painted. Uh, we will take uh, very uh, specific and um, calculated measures to make sure that our air crews uh, can continue to fly safely. Um, in reference to your second question on SDF holding areas, uh, I know that, uh, first off, you know, we are continuing to, uh, in particular in Raqqa, and then in, in Tabqa and to the north of Raqqa, uh, those are uh, continuing to be SDF-held areas as they have uh, beat ISIS uh, in those particular locations. Um, as far as holding that area and uh, specifically to who that goes to, that is uh, something that uh, will have to be addressed uh, in the future, and I don't I can't really predict as to uh, what will happen uh, when uh, you know, either Syrian uh, regime or, uh, or what the SDF will do after that. I know that uh, we are consistently uh, pushing towards uh, local governance, uh, which is you know, the, you know, the councils and the security forces that liberate areas from ISIS are representative and responsive to the people in those areas. Just a quick follow on the first part there. So I'm not asking about a specific flight, a specific aircraft, a specific mission. Have any of the coalition aircraft been painted since, or we could say in the last month, have there been coalition aircraft painted during their operations in the area? I, I do not know that answer. And uh, that is something that um, I would either point you in the direction of the CAOC or I can find that out for you, but I, I don't have an answer to that. Okay, uh, TM Givens Neff, Washington Post. Hey, Colonel Dillon, thanks for doing this. Uh, first question uh, the second Iranian drone that the U.S. shot down a week or so ago, uh, I believe in the release it said it was, a, it was approaching an established combat outpost, which I assume is the outpost at Zeke. Obviously, there's a training base at Tomf. What is the purpose of that established combat outpost, and you know what's the reasoning behind behind it? I know Tomf is a key border crossing. What's the strategic significance of Zeek, and do you plan on building uh, any other outposts closer to Abu Kamal? And I have a follow-up question on civilian casualties. Uh, 
All right. Okay, TM, the, uh, that is correct. It was a combat outpost. It was outside of uh, Atanif. Uh, but this is, as we've stated in the past, that this particular area in and around Atanif is uh, where we have been training with the, uh, our partner forces uh, for over a year. We've been operating out of Atanif uh, for the be since the beginning of the, the year in 2017. Uh, but we also continue to conduct patrols uh, out into the Hamad Desert, going towards uh, the middle Euphrates River Valley and also further to the west. Now with the presence of the regime around, um, we are going to make sure that we continue to deconflict and uh, make sure that we uh, respect uh, what has been uh, discussed in uh, deconfliction. Uh, but what we uh, are going to continue to do is train our partner forces, and that also includes establishing combat outposts and, and also going into the Hamad Desert area, just as we've been doing for uh, well over a year now. Uh, in reference to, I think that covers both of them, the outpost towards Abu Kamal, I, th I think I addressed both of them. So if the regime is uh, has moved into an area that is uh, towards Abu Kamal, uh, then we are going to be limited to how far out we do with the patrols with our partner forces. Got it. And then the follow-up question, I think Air Wars said today that uh, the U.S.-led coalition killed more than 500 civilians in Syria. I know you guys kind of do a rolling estimate uh, on this, but how many assessments have you started, uh, your crew of uh, civilian casualty, the civilian casualty team, how many assessments did you start last month into uh, possible casualties? So right now uh, I am tracking, uh, currently th we have 38 open allegations, uh, but that you know, could have uh, you know, gone up and uh, that, uh, the, the allegations that we have received uh, in May will come out in a couple weeks. Uh, so um, obviously that will give a, a roll up of all of the allegations. Uh, we have seen uh, through air wars and others uh, many ups, um, unsubstantiated social media claims that are taken as, as face value. And as far as I know, the coalition are the only ones who actually take evidence um, and you know, put it together with uh, strike logs and information to give credible uh, uh, assessments after the fact. We will continue to do that. We will continue to take allegations and we take them very seriously. Uh, but you know, we, are, we have seen a lot of the numbers and they're, uh, they are high, uh, but I think that we are the ones who do the, the work to come out to a, a very uh, detailed uh, process that can uh, credibly say uh, whether or not uh, it was credible. Okay, uh, next to um, Kasim Ileri from Anadolu News Agency. Actually, um, my questions have been covered, but I will try to ask it in a different way. Maybe you can get something from me because the answer is still not here. So okay, th there are reports that are saying that Russians have just informed Turks and Israelis about the cruise missile strikes and did not inform the U.S. Could you deny, would you deny those reports? Would you say that the, the Russians have not informed the U.S. and the coalition that they will strike uh, ISIS targets in Syria with cruise missiles? Again, I'll, I'll go back and I'm going to say that the, uh, the deconfliction line is open and it remains in place. If, if Russia or any other actors want to, uh, want to target ISIS, uh, that is very welcome and is something that, uh, that we are okay with. We are going to continue to use the deconfliction line to make sure that our forces are uh, operating in a safe manner, just in the same way that the Syrian regime or Russian forces, uh, when they are operating in an area and we want to conduct strikes, we will use the deconfliction line for that purpose. The deconfliction line being open doesn't really mean that the Russians have informed the coalition that they are going to strike uh, targets in Syria with cruise missiles. The question is whether they have informed, notified or not, rather than whether the confliction line is working or not.
Well, the, the deconfliction line serves that purpose. If they have uh, missiles that are you know, entering into the airspace and we have uh, aircraft or uh, ground forces that are operating in particular areas uh, where those strikes are to happen or to occur, uh, then that is why the deconfliction line exists. And the deconfliction line is open and it is in use. Okay, uh, next to uh, Corey Dickstein, Stars and Stripes. Uh, hey, sir. Um, when going back to the incident where, where the uh, U.S. fighter jet shot down the Syrian fighter jet, when the Syrians bombed the SDF uh, controlled areas, were there any U.S. Uh, special operations forces or any U.S. forces endangered? Um, I know you don't want to get into exactly where American forces are, but did those strikes or any Syrian regime actions endanger American forces? Uh, no American forces were injured or, um, or killed as a result of this. Uh, I'm obviously, uh, otherwise it would have been um, reported, but uh, no, uh, American forces or coalition forces uh, were not um, in that immediate area when uh, those strikes happened. Um, and then just a, a second one. You, you said that it, it, there is a deconfliction zone um, where the SDF are operating, I, I guess. Um, can you kind of explain that? Do you have an agreement, you know, some kind of agreement with the regime then to leave the SDF alone? So right now there is a, a deconfliction line as we have seen the forward line of troops from the Syrian uh, regime and the Syrian Democratic Forces that uh, they have uh, you know, butted up against uh, one another. We want to make sure that there are measures in place to, uh, to make sure that there are, are not incursions. And so uh, between the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Syrian regime and then all the way up through the uh, the Americans and the coalitions and the, the Russian forces, everyone who is operating in the area, uh, a deconfliction line uh, has been established uh, so that we can uh, make sure that we're focused on what we're there to focus on and to not have these incursions and not to have uh, any more strikes uh, as a result of um, not understanding or knowing uh, where the line is and, and where each other can operate. Uh, gentleman in the back, I'm sorry, sir, I don't know your name. Dr. Jetty, uh, Daily Caller. Uh, Turkish officials say that the Secretary Mattis gave them assurances that arms supplied to the SDF would be returned to the U.S. after the Raqqa campaign is over. Can you characterize any systems that are currently in place in order to track these weapons and ensure their return? Well, first off, uh, there was a private letter that went to Secretary Mattis to his counterpart in Turkey, and um, and that that is between uh, between them. We currently have a process in place where we are we know by serial number the weapons and the equipment uh, that we are providing to the SDF. We are very open and transparent with our Turkish uh, allies to the north, and they understand and, and know uh, by serial number and by uh, type of equipment what, those, uh, what that equipment is, what those weapons are. So that process is already in place uh, right now, and we will continue to be transparent with our, our Turkish allies. So follow-up question, did that, uh, did that letter not give a guarantee that the arms would be, uh, would be given back to the U.S.? Uh, from the SDF after the campaign is over? Yeah, again, you know, that is a private letter that went from Secretary Mattis to his counterpart in Turkey, and I'm not going to you know, speak, I'm not going to talk to it because it's, uh, it's a private letter, it's a, a conversation uh, between those two, but I will say we have a process in place and uh, we will continue to use it. Brown, CNN. 
Colonel, thank you for doing this. I just had a couple follow-ups on some of your earlier exchanges. Um, one with uh, TM, I think you said that the if the regime uh, put outposts kind of near Abu Kamal, that would kind of hinder or deter uh, the coalition and, and its local forces' ability to kind of move north into the Euphrates River Valley. Uh, could you clarify that a little bit? I mean, we are we have heard reports that the regime is setting up a lot of outposts. We're setting up these cops. The regime setting up these outposts. Is that having an effect? Is that preventing the coalition and the local forces we're backing move north against the Euphrates River Valley? So what I was saying about that is that out of the Atanaf area, we have used that uh, to train our partner forces and to uh, continue to, to fight ISIS you know, if they are in and around that area. Um, you know, now that the regime has moved in um, and they have uh, made some significant you know, progress as it looks towards moving uh, to Abu Kamal and perhaps uh, Deir ez -Zor, um, if they want to fight ISIS in Abu Kamal and they have the capacity to do so, uh, then you know that that would be welcome. We, as a coalition, are not in the uh, land grab business. We're in the kill and ISIS business, and uh, that is what we want to do. And if uh, if the Syrian regime wants to do that, and they are going to again put forth a concerted effort and show that they are uh, are doing just that in Abu Kamal or Deir Zor or elsewhere. Uh, that means that we don't have to do that uh, in those locations. Uh, so I guess that what I'm saying is uh, in the Atanaf area, we will continue to train uh, our partner forces. We will continue to do patrols in and around Atanaf in the Hamad Desert. Uh, but if uh, our access to Abu Kamal is shut off because the regime is there, that's okay. And just one follow-up. Uh, you, you mentioned that the regime is making a concerted effort to fight ISIS, it looks like now. But you also, we talked about, you know, that push near Topka where they moved tanks and artillery against the SDF. We've seen these drone flights, uh, the bombing run with the SU-22. I mean, clearly they've also made some efforts against uh, U.S. backed forces, coalition backed forces. What do you, is there a broader strategic intent, do you, uh, do you, do you ascertain on the part of the regime to kind of, you know, challenge forces that the coalition is backing, or do you think these are just individual, local, localized events? Yeah, Ryan, I I can uh, I can't characterize or you know guess for uh, what has happened or what uh, what happened is a part of the you know, regime uh, elements. Um, and so I, I, won't, I won't speak to it. I know that you know, there has been some open reporting uh, that has said that they thought that they were fighting ISIS. Well, um, I just, all I know is that you know, we have established a deconfliction line in the, the ground uh, where we want everybody to adhere to so that we can focus on what we're there to focus on without having to get into any further skirmishes, any further engagements between regime, SDF, U.S., coalition, uh, and uh, the regime or pro-regime forces. I, you probably heard me say this 20 times as we look at the transcript, but we want to fight ISIS, and that's where we want our focus to be. And anything that takes us away from doing that uh, is, you know, fewer resources towards uh, doing what we're there to do. And then on the side. Thanks for doing this. Uh, my question on Secretary Mattis' letter to his Turkish counterpart is covered, so I have a second one. And actually, it goes back to Barbara's question on the Iranian-backed militia uh, being uh, active in the in the Abu Kamal Derizor region. So, uh, just a bit of clarification on this, maybe when you're talking about uh, everyone targeting ISIS is welcome so that you don't have to fight with ISIS in those areas. Does that specifically include the Iranians, the Iranian back militia? And does that hold for their resource specifically? Uh, you came in, you know, awfully broken up, uh, but I think you're asking about Iranian uh, militia uh, fighting um, ISIS as well. Um, I, you know, 
we are working through the Russians um, and uh, as they you know, talk to the regime and pro-regime elements. Um, and again, if, if they are showing a concerted effort towards uh, looking to defeat ISIS and can uh, show that they are, are doing that and they are actually defeating ISIS, uh, then, uh, like I said, that is not a bad thing. Uh, that is what we're there to do, but if others are there to do it as well, um, then, then we're okay with that. We, uh, Laurent is up next, but I'm going to save you, Laurent, to the end, where you're going to get the last question today. Uh, so we'll take a couple of follow-ups uh, in advance of that. Uh, Barbara, start, well, the new one? We're, we're new business. Okay, Carla. Hi, Colonel. You had just told Ryan that if access is shut off to Abu Kamal because the regime is there, that's okay. Has that already happened? Well, they are you know, between uh, the uh, our elements that are currently in Atanaf and uh, moving to Abu Kamal uh, to the uh, to the northeast. Um, that's not to say that we could not uh, continue to um, you know, bring forces in you know, through another means or another way. We clearly are continuing to conduct strikes in the area, uh, but uh, I would say that you know, without having to you know uh, work you know, some kind of, um, not deal, but you know, I, th I think that the only way we could get to Abu Kamal right now, if that were something that was even uh, on the, the table, it would have to be from a different l direction or a different location. Uh, but we will continue to strike ISIS targets wherever we find them, in Abu Kamal or anywhere else along the uh, Euphrates River Valley going north. Uh, Barbara, I think you had a follow-up. I need to come back on this very same point because I, I'm sort of really not understanding this. You seem to be saying, Colonel, that U.S.-backed forces, leaving aside airstrikes for the moment, that U.S.-backed forces will now potentially, and U.S. forces will now potentially defer to both the Syrians and the Iranians on the ground if you believe they're fighting ISIS. I don't know if you believe they're making a concerted effort. What does a concerted effort from a military standpoint mean? Do you wait to see <coughs> if they're striking ISIS targets? How long do you wait? Do you ask the militias, that, the people that you're training to wait? Is this a new policy of the U.S. to wait? And you've suggested a deferring on the ground to the Syrian regime and to the Iranian-backed forces. And I'm just not clear what that means. All right, I don't know if there's a specific uh, question in there, but I guess uh, what I would say is that, not guess what I say, what I will say is that clearly our focus right now is on the fight in Raqqa, and we're supporting our you know, Syrian Democratic Forces there. So we're going to see that through. And once uh, we call the liberation, or once uh, Raqqa has been liberated, then we have to see then where else is there to go, where else is there ISIS-held territory. And right now we know that ISIS held territory is along the middle uh, Euphrates River Valley. Uh, but is that going to you know, still be true at the end of the fight in Raqqa? We're going to have to see that. We're three weeks into Raqqa right now, and we've made you know, significant progress. Uh, but we know that there's still a, a difficult fight ahead. So we will have to evaluate and see where uh, ISIS still holds territory after the fight of Raqqa. Clearly right now, that's along the middle Euphrates River Valley, and as you asked in your first question, we will continue to strike uh, resources and leaders uh, throughout that middle U Euphrates River Valley in Mayadeen, Abu Kamal, al uh, So again, we're going to have to see where things go after Raqqa, and we'll see what the, where the regime is at that point, and if they are in fact making an effort to uh, defeat ISIS in, their, in those ISIS-held territories. You're talking, you were talking much more near term, I thought, that 
you see regime forces moving, you know the Iranian-backed militias are moving, and that the coalition, the U.S.-led coalition, is now going to defer uh, if you see them making progress against ISIS. So are, is it U.S. military policy now to defer to the regime and to the Iranian-backed militias? All right, maybe it's, uh, it's awfully nascent right now to be able to say where, uh, where, where the Abu Kamal and the Deir ez you know, fight is going to be, where the regime is going to be. They are moving along in that direction right now. But again, it's something, I, I don't see that as necessarily near term. Uh, and I just told you where our focus is, but we will have to see in the future after Raqqa and see where everybody else is uh, in and around Syria at that time. Zach, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, I wanted to go back to something Nancy asked about. So when the SDF was initially getting armed uh, with coalition arms uh, last month, uh, we were told that both there was a database being kept of the arms and that trainers and advisors who are embedded with the SDF would be keeping an eye on how the weapons are used to make sure that they're being used specifically against ISIS. Um, if those arms are being used by the SDF and resulting in civilian casualties, are those trainers and advisors obligated to report those incidents up the chain of command uh, that would disclose some of those civilian casualties that are, could be the result of use of coalition arms? I'm not going to speculate, you know, if uh, type questions. So, you know, we haven't seen that uh, to, to date right now. Um, we do have advisors who are uh, advised and accompanying and assisting uh, our Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, and they are there with them. So uh, I'm not going to speculate on something that hasn't happened yet. A follow up on, on just Raqqa in general. I haven't really heard much about it as far as uh, the defensive belt and it basically what are the uh, the SDF casualties looking like? I don't know if you can give a specific number or if they're heavy or moderate. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead and, and give you uh, numbers at all. Uh, what I will say is that. In the first uh, two weeks, uh, there was uh, significant progress, very you know, quick progress that was made. Uh, the SDF uh, and the advance have since hit uh, some significant resistance from ISIS. And uh, now we are starting to see um, some of these you know, better uh, in place defenses uh, as we have uh, gotten to the places where we have, uh, where we have advanced to uh, in the campaign in and around Raqqa. I'm not going to give you numbers. I will say that the resistance uh, by ISIS uh, has uh, steadily increased in this last week. I wanted to save our last question today for uh, Laurent Bartholomew from Agence France Presse. Uh, uh, and it, as, as a Ryan drinks an extra do dose of truth serum uh, in advance of your final question, I just wanted to say on behalf of the Department of Defense, thank you for uh, faithfully covering this department for the last five years. Uh, uh, oh, only two. It seems like you've been in town longer, I guess. Um, but uh, you have uh, uh, been great to work with. Uh, you have uh, reported on us faithfully, uh, aggressively, honestly. Um, and uh, we're sad to see you uh, moving back to France. You also have the coolest accent of anybody in the Pentagon press, and we will miss you. Uh, so with that said, sir, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, what you said. Thank you. Uh, Colonel, uh, you, you have said that you would be uh, perfectly happy to deconflict uh, with the Syrian regime forces in their push towards uh, Deir ez and Abu Kamal. Uh, just to be clear, are you actually asking the regime to share information uh, with, uh, with the coalition on their moves, on their intention? And, and would, you, would you consider some kind of uh, direct uh, conversation uh, with the regime forces on their move? Thanks, Laurent. Um, so, no, we are not talking with uh, the regime, but clearly we are, are able to see uh, their advance and where they are on the battlefield. 
Uh, and when I said, you know, perfectly happy, uh, I think I meant perfectly happy with the defeat of ISIS, regardless of who it is uh, who, who was able to do that. Um, so if I said you we're know, perfectly happy with the regime, um, you know, moving, I want to just clarify that we're perfectly happy with you know, ISIS being defeated, regardless of who that is. Uh, that said, um, you know, we, we, are, are, we can see their movements and how far along they are moving. Uh, and that's, that's a, we're not coordinating with them or uh, deconflicting with them. Uh, that deconfliction remains solely with the Russian forces. And j just a quick uh, follow-up. Uh, would you say uh, that um, it could be the regime uh, that finally uh, leads the last battle against uh, ISIS in Syria, in the, in the Euphrates uh, River Valley? I mean, I'm not going to, I will say it is, you know, you know is it likely or you know, probable? Uh, I don't know, but uh, that could be the case. So we're, again, we're going to have to see where, where everybody is uh, and how, uh, how the collective efforts of, you know, defeating ISIS, you know, in our own particular ways, where everything is going to, you know, pan out at the very end. Um, but the one thing that is constant and consistent throughout both Iraq and Syria is that ISIS is losing and their losses are irreversible and uh, we know that uh, that that time will happen when there's no longer a physical caliphate and um, we'll be you know, that is what our mission is here is to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria and uh, we want to accomplish that all right Thank you, Ryan, very much for your time today. Uh, and uh, for everybody, have a good weekend. Thank you, Laurent, and Godspeed to you. Thank you. Thanks, Laurent. Safe travels.